Chapter 13. Once again they were in a station, once again the wait, the crowds, and finally the trains of wood. When eventually the passenger train arrived, it was already packed with the soldiers traveling to Orangenbaum. Some of the paying passengers on the platform managed to force themselves on board, hanging on to the steps and pushing through masses of people. Others, less forceful, were left on the platforms. Most of the children leapt for their usual places under the cars, although Peter and Alex chose to climb upon the roof for the fresh air. The train stopped several times, but approaching their destination, their boys stayed close to the carriages, not risking the train leaving without them. Used to traveling for a few days, a few hours were a mere moment in time, a flick of the eye. They stopped at the last stop. They arrived at the last stop before they knew it. Everyone was getting off the train. The children stayed quietly in their boxes or flattened on the top of cars until all the soldiers had ambled off in the direction of the rest houses. Then, following Basil's instructions, they slipped across the tracks and behind the station. As he had told him, there were two paths leading out into the countryside, one south and one veering off slightly to the northwest, where the sun was low. Anya, well rested from a long night's sleep, and more rest from her traveling box, kept up at the rest except to complain of what she said were curtains in her eyes. Finally, Alex stopped and removed soot from her enormously long eyelashes, and she was off again, scootering among them like a pet dog. Slow down, Peter told her. We're supposed to keep out of sight. They formed a long, single line. Peter walked ahead and signaling them to stop whenever he saw anyone or anything in the distance. A cart, a music. But in the main, they were walking in the open country, rolling slightly up and down, silent and empty. Alex began to wonder if this was, after all, the right road. Basil had said five miles more or less, but they seemed to have been walking that far, and yet there were no habitations at all. But off in the distance, one could see the gulls, and the wind seemed to gust from there. Perhaps the Gulf of Finland did lie beyond. Alex tried to contain his fears and his impatience. Now, along a row that paralleled the field, they heard the sound of voices and of tramping feet. Then they saw a horse-drawn wagon with six soldiers, such as those they had seen on the train, walking and laughing, passing around a bottle. Down, Peter hissed, and they all flattened out in the field among the dried grasses that poked through the layer of snow, while the soldiers passed by and disappeared into the distance. Now be quiet, Peter ordered. There may be more. Anya was tiring, and Alex carried her on his shoulders. She was taller than all of them that way, and before long she said, There are some houses just over there. Can you see them? In a minute they did see them, tiny cottages. The children drew down among the bushes and surveyed them. This must be the place, Peter said. There are three cottages together, just as Basil said. Once again, Alex was appointed to make the contact. Remember, Leon said, it's the first cottage. They all watched as Alex crossed the road and approached the thatch roof buildings. He was observed. A man came out of the first little house. Tall and burly, dressed in heavy fisherman's clothing, he leaned in the doorway. Alex, very frightened, hesitated. He was looking for the special thing that would identify the man as Nikolai, but he was not close enough. Now, yes, he thought he saw it, and then again, no. What is it, comrade? the man asked. It was too late to turn back. Alex came closer, and as he did, the man turned fully towards him. In the dimming afternoon light, his beard could be seen, half red, half black. I'm Alex, he said. Are you Nikolai? Perhaps, the man said. Perhaps not. Why should you ask, and why should I answer you? Because if you are Nikolai, I have a letter from Leningrad for you. The man looked nervously to the right and left. Down the hill, the gulf glistened under the cold sky. The light was going fast now. Come in, he said. Alex followed him quickly into the little house, and the man closed the door, then the shutters. He lit a smoky oil lamp, then read the note. I'm Nikolai, he said. Where are the others? Across the road and behind the bushes, Alex answered, looking around the warmth and shelter of this simple cottage, and feeling a longing to lie beside its hearth and sleep for days. Fetch them, but only a few at a time. I will signal when the coast is clear. This is the road to the resort where many of the soldiers like to stay, and we must be careful. Sometimes they stroll about. At the signal, Alex sped across the road and fell into the bushes. It's all right, it's all right, he whispered, but he felt as if he was shouting. Now, rumbling in the distance, announced an approaching cart. It seemed to take forever to come around the curve in the road, and when it did, it proved to be another cart of soldiers. Nikolai, standing in the doorway, waved to them. Have a good vacation, comrades, he called with a smile. 
but when they passed, his face turned serious as if he had turned off a light. He watched them pass scowling, then signaled. Alex pushed Kostya, Anya, and Leon on their way. They hurried across the road and into the house. Then the rest, two or three at a time, until he and Peter joined them. Nikolai surveyed this motley group, huddled in the little room. First Basil sends me one, then two, then three. Just this once, Nikolai, then four. Now look, how many? Twelve? Well, there are twelve months, twelve disciples, so why not twelve waifs? He went to the fire where water was heating and made coffee of ground oats. They took turns drinking the scalding liquid from tin cups that were on the hearth. Into a black pot at the back of the fire, Nikolai put some potatoes to boil. Alex felt stunned by all that had occurred. After all these months, here was the grown man taking charge of his comfort and safety, offering food and shelter. Anya was asleep with her head on his lap. He was surprised to find the tears on her face were his. Nikolai spoke little at first, except to warn them to be very quiet. After he had given them each a boiled potato, he said, I am known in these parts to be a solitary, bad-tempered fisherman. There are few people living here, but those that know enough not to bother me. Still, I am thought to live alone here. You must not put yourselves or me or any other travelers like yourselves in danger by making noise, by giving away this place. Should anyone approach, you must all go down there, he lifted a hatch in the floor, and quickly. They were tired, and despite their excitement, it did not take more than a word from Nikolai for them to crawl into a hodgepodge on the floor and sink into slumber. He himself stayed propped up in a corner, eyes open through the night. Sometime near dawn, a loud thud awakened everyone. Then further thumps of something heavy being dragged. The children started for the hatch, but Nikolai signaled for them to be quiet and to stay where they were. They huddled wide-eyed and frightened as a door slammed. Then Nikolai said, they are smugglers of alcohol. They use the next cottage as a way stop. They will be gone at nightfall, but we will have to keep very silent all day. Hush now. The day was spent dozing and resting quietly in the little college cottage. Nikolai went out for a few times so that his life would appear normal. Before he left, he herded the children into the tiny dirt cellar, airless and chill. But when he came back, he brought a string of fish, which he cooked on the fire and gave to the children with tea. As he had predicted... When night fell, the thumps were heard again and the sound of a wagon pulling up to the house. Then the clopping of a horse and a rattling of the wagon announced the smuggler's departure. Good, Nikolai said. I will tell you the truth. When they arrived, I thought they couldn't have picked a worse time. They are always a nuisance. I have been thinking all night how I could take you all, and their arrival might prove the answer to our problem. You see, he said, my boat is too small for all of you, but the smuggler's boat is large with high sides to shield the cargo. He filled a jug with fresh water, put some bread in a canvas sack, and said, Come now, we will make a try for it. Into the dark they followed Nikolai down to the sandy bank, where at the edge of the water the ice sparkled blackly and whitely in the moonlight, crunching ominously, almost hungrily, flow against flow. They hid in the bushes while Nikolai surveyed the situation. A small fishing boat was pulled up on the shore, and near it a large catch, such as those used for deep sea fishing. Nikolai threw the jug and sack into this one and was just raising his hand to signal when another fishing boat appeared a few meters down the bank. A man was pushing it over the ice floes, puffing so heavily he could be heard by all. It seemed to take him forever to anchor his boat and to catch it, take his catch on his shoulder up the bank and out of sight. When they all thought all was clear, two soldiers appeared, strolling down the shore, slapping their shoulders to keep warm. When they saw Nikolai, they stopped to talk. Out late fishing, comrade, one soldier asked. Alex's heart skipped. No, Nikolai answered, appearing to be working on a rope or not, just securing my boat. Last night, it shifted with the ice. It's beginning to break up, one soldier said. One of our group tried to walk on it last night when he had two, a few vodkas in him. They are still throw, throwing him out. They lapped, uh, laughed uproariously. Cold as he had been in these last months, Alex could not see the joke in their freezing comrade. Would they ever go? We're supposed to be on vacation, one soldier said, but we get special commendation if we catch anybody escaping. The station master thought he saw some people running across the track. Sometimes we can pull them up in like fish, but in this weather, not many try it. I can understand that, Nikolai said. It is difficult to get through a sea that is part ice. And finally, the soldiers, tired of the talk, or got too cold to stand around. They turned and started back down the shore. All the same one called, keep your eyes open. 
You can come down to the rest house and tell us. We would see that the local Soviet knows of your diligence. Thank you, comrades, Nikolai said. In the bushes, the children were stiff with cold and suspense. Nikolai ordered them to run up and down the shore for a bit before he started to organize them for their departure. We'll have to push the boats on the ice a short way, but you must be careful. Push too far and you will be in the water. I will go first, pushing the big boat with Peter and Kostya. Alex, you will push the little boat with Leon. He picked up Anya and put her in the little boat. The rest of you will follow behind carefully. Don't crowd each other. With no light but the stars, Nikolai and Peter pushed the smuggler's big boat over the hard ice flows to a point where the ice began to crackle underfoot. Then they stopped. Nikolai came back and helped push the boat and lead the others. He nudged the smaller boat until it gently broke through the ice and into the water. Anya was alarmed. Take me out, she cried. I don't want to go to sea. Hush, Nikolai commanded, clapping his hand over her mouth. Do you want to tell the world you are out here? You're all right. Here are some companions for you. And he lifted two of the smaller children into the boat. Then he held on to the rope and tied it to the larger boat. The rest of you pay attention now, he said, and started loading them into the larger boat. Very carefully now, he said. The lightest boy in first, then the next, and so forth. Everyone else be ready to catch on to the sides when it starts to break through the ice. The growling of the ice started when three of them were aboard, and the rest leapt for the gun rails before they even got more than their feet wet. Wet feet were nothing new to them. Now he hauled in the rope and reached into the little boat, transferring the three small children into the larger boat and covering them with sacks. He assigned Alex and Peter to one set of oars and took another pair himself. We are heading that way, he pointed. We will use the stars as a guide. We are going north and east. For now, keep the lights of the soldier's house, rest house in view. Row straight from there. Though neither Peter nor Alex had ever held an oar, they soon caught the rhythm. Look alive there, Nikolai called. You have to pay, pull your weight or we will be all night crossing. Warmed and strengthened by the hot food they had been given while staying in the cottage and rested from a day of enforced quiet, Peter and Alex were well up to the job of oarsmen, through the, though the water was rough. They pulled together and the boat fought the wind in the water, breaking through the choppy waves. After the novelty of the city sea had palled, the youngest children fell asleep, and only the sound of the wa was the water was the creak of the oars that slapped the waves against the side of the boat. Alex's mind was teeming with so many thoughts he found it hard to focus on one. Leaving Russia, how shocked he had been by the idea when Katriana had first mentioned it. Katriana. Basil had said she had really left Russia. Finland. Would they find? What would they find there? Would he ever see his family again? What would it be like, do you think, Peter, he asked aloud, just to talk, knowing full well that Peter knew no more than he? Less, perhaps? Peter only shrugged and grunted. Alex had noticed how Peter had grown quiet since Miska's death and the terrible thing at the children's home. Occasionally there were signs of the old Peter, their leader, in charge, but mostly he seemed to be deep inside of himself. Then, suddenly, out of the dark night, a bright light appeared and approached them quickly. Hush, Nikolai warned them. Peter and Alex get under the sacks of the others. No one say a word. The light grew closer and proved to be a lantern on the prow of a mid-sized launch manned by soldiers. Stop and be searched, a soldier called. Ahoy, comrade, Nikolai called through his cupped hands. I'm glad to see you. Can you point me shoreboard? I've lost my bearings. Yes? How does a fisherman come to lose his bearings? And how do you come to be fishing so late? I fell asleep and drifted, comrades said. Uh, comrades, Nikolai said, acting sheepish. Well, we shall have a look at your boat anyways, the soldier said. You say you are a fisherman and there is a lot of smuggling going on here now and in just such a boat. Nikolai laughed. Smuggler? Me? I'm strong, he said. But do I look strong enough to row a boat full of spirits across the gulf by myself? I wouldn't be home until Friday. And he laughed again. Under the sacks, the children shivered with fear, and Alex held Anya's arms to keep her from squirming. The soldier was just starting to let himself over the side of the launch, preparing to leap into Nikolai's boat, when a call from the deck above stopped him. Let's not waste time, an officer told him. It would take four men to row that boat full of spirits, two at the very least. Then he called, the shore is that way. Best stay awake, comrade, or you may join the fishes. 
They resumed their rowing as soon as the boat was well out of sight, but they were nervous and alert. When they had been rowing for a couple of hours, and all arms were aching, Nikolai called a rest. They shipped their oars, and the dripping cold water fell onto the faces of some of the sleeping children. They awoke, saying, Where are, are we there? Alex gave them each a sip of water and a crust of bread. What will happen to us when we get to Finland? Nikolai asked. There are some people, a little town near Bajorko, who will see that you have shelter and food until it is decided what is best for you to do. Some families may be found in Finland or may have passed through there. Some of you may want to stay. Some of you may later want to travel farther, to Poland, to Germany, to England, even to America. Why don't you go, Nikolai? Alex asked. Sometime, perhaps, but for now I am a fisherman and there is still a lot of fishing to be done. How will you take both boats back? Peter now asked, after one of his long silences that Alex had noted. Isn't this too big for you to row yourself? I will just take the small one, Nikolai said, because I must be back before dawn for everything to seem normal. If the smuggler's boat is gone and I am too, they may make a connection. It would take me too long to row the big one back myself, although I certainly wish I had the use of it again. There is good cover for it for a mile or so below my hut, where I could hide it. As for the smugglers, I feel I fear they will have to find another boat anyways. Alex thought. He had been a student priest in the seminary, and now he is thinking like a thief, like us. Once again, with weary arms, they moved the oars through the water. It's not much farther, Nikolai said encouragingly. Keep going. Only a little later, he said, now turn around. See the light on that point? That is Bajorko, Finland. The shore just this side is where you're going. Here, he reached into his fishing basket and took out a tail of flare and some nap tallow flare and matches after you get a little closer he said you will light this with these matches hold it high when you see a flare in response make for that point some people who watch every night will be there though they will be surprised to see so many of you after a few more minutes of rowing he shipped the oars and stood in the boat goodbye now my friends i will have a hard row back by daylight so i will get a head start you can do the rest easily here he handed the oars to Kostya and Ivan. Give it a try, you two. They moved into a seat. You know what to do, he said, looking at Peter and Alex. God go with you. And he stepped from the bigger boat into his little fishing craft, untied the rope, and waving a swift goodbye, turned his little boat and started back the way he had come. The children were surprised by this sudden move. But wait, Alex called. Wait, we have to, to thank you. We have to, we need. Row straight and you will thank me, Nikolai called. The light on the point seemed much nearer. Pieces of ice now started to crack against the boat. The oars moved slowly, moved small flows through the water. Suddenly, the long, silent Peter was Peter again. Okay, now we light the flare, he directed. He reached for the matches. The first went out in the wind, so did the second. Be careful, Kostya said. If we run out of matches, we will not be able to signal. Peter, Peter drove, dove down into the bottom of the boat, sheltering the match and the flare with his body. The last match lit it. The flare was met by applause from all the children, awake and alert now. They raised their heads above the sides of the dory and pinned their gazes on the shore as Peter held the flare high. They stared hard into the darkness for an answering light. How long can it burn? Leon asked. I don't know, Peter said. The torch flickered in the wind. Will we live in the boat? The matter of fact, Anya asked. No, Alex said. We have lived in a cellar, a cave, and a train, but we will not live on this boat. And then at last there was a flare of light on the shore, just why Nikolai had said it would be. It moved from left to right. Someone was signaling. Peter moved the flare the same way from left to right. Come on now, he said. Let's get back on these oars. It was harder now without Nikolai's strong arms, even though Kostya and Ivan worked strenuously at their oars. The ice flows were gathering, and the going was slow. Still, the flows seemed less dense than they had been at the start of their journey, and they were able to row nearly to the shore when the, last, when the boat wedged itself against the ice and would go no further. Out, Peter said, one at a time. Hold hands and start walking towards the light. Go. He stood and put Anya on the ice. The others followed. Leon leading until they were strung out in a line, moving toward the shore where the ice became stronger and stronger. 
Kostya and Ivan got out, then Alex. Come on, Peter, Alex said, steadying the boat for him. No, Peter said slowly, I'm not going. Not going, Alex cried. What are you going to do, stay here on the ice, live in the boat? I am going to go back and, and fish with Nikolai. You don't know anything about fishing. Peter laughed and his laugh rang on the cold ice and water and somehow sounded warm and good to Alex because it sounded like Peter. I know about this kind of fishing. I'm going back to Moscow and get, um, get some more children and bring them to Nikolai. I think I should become a ferryman. He seemed happy for the first time since the terrible events in the South. Cheer up, he said. But Peter, will you ever come back to the band? Kostya asked. Perhaps, Peter said, when we have fished the sea for all the good fish. Again, Alex felt the constriction in his throat, the pain of separation he had come to recognize as the most agonizing pain of all. A pain that cut deep and remained to ache, and then remained to ache. No, Peter, he entreated. Come with us. We are a, a family. Life was stopping again. Yes, Peter said, and I am going back for the others in the family. Das Vidanya, he said. Say it to all of them for me. And with a mighty pull of the oars, he launched himself back into the gulf, disappearing quickly into a rising mist. Was the mist on the water or in their eyes? Alex and the children and the others now carefully picked their way across the ice towards the firmer tundra, turning now and then to see Peter in the distance, not feeling cold nor hunger because the other pain was so strong. Now they could see the children gathering on the shore and others, perhaps three or four adults, their voices carried on the ice. Alex heard someone speaking in accented Russian. What a catch! How many fish do we get tonight? Follow me, fish! He saw someone bend and wrap a blanket around Anya. Then he heard a woman's voice speaking in perfect Russian. Thor, please carry this little girl. And Anya protesting in her toughest voice, I can walk like the rest. There was something about the woman's voice that made Alex's heart nearly jump from his chest. And then she turned, saw him, and held out her arms. Once again, life began. The End